Uh, we are very glad that we have uh, Professor Han Shon Chong uh, from Korea to be our keynote speaker. Uh, she is a professor of media literacy at the Department of Korea Language Education, Jiangxi National University of Education, South Korea. She has advice on media education policies and programs of many public organizations and non-profit organizations in her country. Her research interests include media literacy, digital technology, and digital parenting. And recently, she had directed several research projects for Ministry of Education in South Korea. And she uh, published a lot of uh, journal articles in South Korea and contributed chapters to many media literacy books. And uh, now I would like to invite Professor Zhang uh, to present her keynote speech. The title is Media Literacy Education and Digital Citizenship in the Age of Smartphones, YouTube, and Disinformation. Understanding South Korea Context for Global Dialogue. Professor Zhang, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Alice, for your kind words to introduce me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, participate in this uh, wonderful media education conference. Uh, thank you um, also to the conference organizing committee and, uh, of the Bournemouth University uh, and Hong Kong Baptist, Baptist University who have been taking care of us uh, very kindly and authentically. I have been so much inspired by the keynote speeches and the presentations uh, in the panels yesterday. A year ago, um, sorry. I received an email from Alice Lee uh, to invite me to come to Hong Kong. And she told me that this conference will be an excellent opportunity to promote media literacy in Asia and ask me to speak about the development of media literacy education in South Korea in the digital era. I was a little hesitant at first because I'm not very good at speaking to a large number of audience. Um, but in the end, I decided to come and speak because I wanted to share uh, some of the developments that might not have been very well known to the outside of my country, partly because of the language barriers. And I also wanted to uh, take this opportunity to have global dialogues with you to reflect on the current situation of media culture and the issues of media literacy education in South Korea. So today I'm going to begin by describing what is the current situation of the media use in South Korea and what are the main issues in terms of media literacy. Next, I'll introduce the key players of media literacy education policies and what they might have done and achieved. Then I'll move <coughs> on to talk about the difficulties and problems that we might have now and then raise some questions that we might need to think about together in order to try to solve these problems. So South Korea uh, ranks number one worldwide in terms of smartphone ownership and internet usage. As nine in 10 Korean adults use the internet and own a smartphone, according to a research report released in January this year, by the US-based Pew Research Center. In the survey, South Korea recorded the highest smartphone ownership with a rate of 94%. The second race was Israel, 
followed by Australia, Sweden, the Netherlands, and Lebanon, and so on. Korea was also found to be, to be the most wired country in the world, uh, as it shows the highest internet penetration rate of 96%. In conclusion, few research centers said that South Korea stands out as the most heavily connected society. So as you can see in the infographic of the uh, survey of the uh, Korea Internet and uh, Security Agency, uh, over 90% among the people of the age of over three use the internet at least once within a month. The rates of the children under the age of 10 and the elderly in their 60s are also very high. In fact, as you can see in this infographic, uh, using smartphones, social media, and digital platforms in order to get access to information and various contents and to communicate with others has become a crucial part of everyday life in South Korea. On the left side of the slide, you could recognize Facebook, Google, Instagram, but also you can find the domestic platforms such as Neighbor on Internet Portal, KakaoTalk, a mobile instant messenger and social media, and Band, a mobile online community service that are popularly used in South Korea. So, um, this goes just automatically. Okay, um, let me show you a short news clip to help you to understand. Okay, so um, let me show you a short clip, a uh, news clip to help you to understand how the South Korea might be using the Kakao for the most popular instant messenger and social networking service. These days, a great number of people get up to date on the news through Facebook or Twitter. But here in Korea, the trend is a bit different. A survey shows that Koreans still got most of their news through the countries of most popular global messaging app, our Social media offers a round-the-clock stream of news content tailored to the individual interests of billions of users. Among these services in Korea, the most popular source of news isn't Facebook or Twitter, but the mobile messaging app, Kakao Talk. That's according to the 2017 Digital News Report released this week by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford. The survey showed that among a thousand respondents, about 40% say they use Kakao Talk the most to get their news, relegating Facebook and YouTube to second and third place. Kakao Talk was launched in 2010 as a relatively simple but free text messaging app. It wasn't long before it became a part of everyday life for the overwhelming majority of Koreans. And despite not being a portal website or a news organization, Kakao Talk has far more users than apps from conventional news outlets. The new section is easily accessible from my friends list, so I use it often. I use the Kakao News service to get the latest updates on news from other countries. As you can see, Kakao Talk is popular not only as a mobile messenger, but also as a news provider for its convenience and wide selection of content. Social media growth continues unabated, but how long can this trend last? The answer seems to be, according to the experts, for a long time to come. Unless a completely new platform can replace social media, this trend is likely to continue. It's also highly unlikely that one of the more traditional platforms would return to become the force it once was. Kakao Talk is a very flexible organizational culture, which is its biggest strength. It's hard to forecast what changes lie ahead, but I believe the company will adapt to them quite well. Unless a new powerful platform appears, Kakao Talk is likely to maintain its dominance for the foreseeable future. New technologies are giving us ever more interactive ways to get our news. With over 90% of Koreans subscribed, Kakao Talk has used the modern day necessity, text messaging, to put the latest news at the tip of our fingers, or thumbs as it were. And as long as we keep chatting away, it seems Kakao Talk as a news service can only keep growing. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. Okay, this 
this news shows how a domestic service of cacao talk is popularly used for everyday communication as well as getting access to various contexts such as news. But to our surprise, that was the last year. This year, the trend has changed so quickly, and now YouTube ranks the number one app that is used in South Korea for the longest time. As you can see in the graph, Kakao was in the second place, followed by Neighbor, Facebook, and the Dam, another domestic internet voter. Kakao is still the number one app used as an instant messenger, but YouTube is the number one platform to get access to various contents produced by the mainstream news providers, as well as various internet creators. With the widespread of digital media, as I have just described, there have been various issues uh, raised in the Korean society in terms of media literacy. The issues include various dysfunctions of informatization, including internet, internet dependency and indulgence, malicious comments, leaking personal information, defamation, and the distribution of violent and pornography content that might be found in many countries and societies. So with a growing digital convergence,
Another characteristic of the digital media, a culture is individualization. And the digital culture is regarded as a snack culture. Uh, this means that people use the uh, digital content and they like to just like they eat snacks. Five to fifteen minutes web content such as web dramas, web cartoons, or broadcast clips that are edited as short versions in order to be easily and um, quickly consumed. Soft news and hard news or video clips are popular forms of the news consumed through social media and smartphones. People are surrounded by the similar ideas and opinions that our friends on the social media recommended to them. So in this context of digital media culture, misinformation, or fake news, and so-called internet witch hunt occurs sometimes and causes serious problems. So there was an alarming incident called the Seoul bus number 240 in September last year. This incident began by a post on the internet community that reported that a five-year-old child went off alone from the bus and that her mother cried down and asked the driver to open the door, but the bus driver had cursed on her and wouldn't let her go. The post was saying that the bus driver should be punished for child abuse. When this post came up on the internet community, it began to fuel outrage on the bus driver. It was spread within just three hours three, uh, through social media, and then it was reported on the mainstream television, but even without proper fact-checking. The next day, the investigation on the incident by the Seoul Metropolitan Government began and the daughter of the bus driver wrote on the internet by saying that the accusation of her father was not made on what really happened. On the third day of the incident, the public opinion was reversed as the CCTV video was released and the post of the bus driver's daughter was spread quite quickly. In the end, the person who wrote the first post wrote a message of his apologies on the internet on the next day. But the bus driver asked for sick leave due to the severe shock and stress. This incident showed how misinformation and fake news or disinformation without fact checking, which just repeated uh, what went on the internet, can mislead people and the society. In the process, ordinary people's lives can be suddenly and critically damaged in the digital era, and that could happen to anybody. So in uh, fighting against fake news, I agree with many people that we should be very cautious of using this term. But anyway, uh, that is now a huge social and political issue in South Korea now, and it calls for media literacy education. Let me show you a recent news clip on this issue. The increase of fake news and half-baked truths on social media has caused people to question nearly everything they read. In the last installment of our three-part series, Ko Young explores what needs to be done to restore faith in media and help the public distinguish what's real and what's fake. It seems that Korean society needs more fundamental solutions in its fight against fake news. After the Justice Ministry last week proposed tough measures to crack down on the spread of false information, Experts are concerned that this will only suppress the problem rather than resolve it. There are already laws against defamation and invasion of privacy, so we should start by questioning where existing policies have failed and what we need to change. The term fake news is still vague in definition, so imposing new policies without clarity is worrying. It could clamp down on the freedom of expression, so this issue must be approached with prudence. Instead of restrictive measures, Paul stressed the role of the government and the media in helping the public distinguish between different shadings of the truth. But first, the media needs to win that public trust. With the deluge of disinformation, a survey by the Korea Press Foundation this year found that only one out of four South Koreans trust the news stories that they consume. 61% were worried about fake news. I think there's a lot of fabrication, so I take in about half of what I see and filter out the rest. 
I'd say I trust about 30 to 40 percent of what I see. I don't trust traditional broadcasters either. I get suspicious because of their ties to politics. To boost their credibility, experts say journalists in Korea need to improve the quality of their reporting and help expose fake news by setting the facts straight. A number of papers and broadcast programs now carry fact-checking news reports. But it's not just the task for politicians or journalists. Battling disinformation also requires a conscious effort from the public, especially as social media platforms tend to recommend content based on the user's preferences. I would be really call for um, people to be given better guidance um, about what's real and what's fake, but also to engage in more critical thinking and public discourse about these kind of debates. Popular online platforms also have some responsibility for improving media literacy. Experts say they need to invest more in educating their users to help them spot fake news. They should also develop ways to present content from legitimate credible sources while maintaining diversity of opinion. Woo News. Okay. Uh, from Media Leaders' perspective, we know that it's not always easy to distinguish what's real and what's fake by only reading the content without considering the intentions and context of the creators of the media messages and critically analyzing the representations and also how the news might be coming to us through various digital platforms. We also know that media literacy might not be the ultimate solution in fighting against fake news, but the current situation calls for media literacy as a solution ever more increasingly. And last month, we had a new minister for Ministry of Education. In fact, she has been preparing for the legislation for media education as a member of the Congress. The legislation might be able to help to promote media literacy education, but it might not be the only, uh, enough measure to transform the ways in which we teach media literacy in schools. So extreme, and, and I'm, I'm moving on to another topic. Extreme hate speech is another huge social problem related to the digital media. In February last year, the National Human Rights Commission of Korea released the report on the current situation of hate speech and regulatory measures to combat hate speech. The report states the prevalence of online and offline hate speech targeting women LGBTQ persons with disabilities, as well as foreign migrants and refugees. Hate speech has become a significant social problem in South Korea since around 2010, when the online community called Ilbe Daily Best Repository started causing concerns due to posts revealing or inciting disgust and hatred against women. With the growing popularity of YouTube, extreme hate speech is evolving into hate videos of extreme content. And according to the Korea Press Foundation media issue in August this year, 34% of YouTube users saw or received videos that appear to be false or fake news. It noted that people in their 20s and 60s are more likely to see or receive fake news than other age groups. Professor Hwang Byung Seok at Gyeonggu uh, University in Korea says that fake news looks like a news phenomenon at first glance, but it is actually a political communication phenomenon that occurs in social media. So he argues that the issue of fake news should be interpreted that people in their 20s and 60s are actively participating in political communication. This means that the issue of fake news is not just a simple matter of distinguishing fact from opinion or lies, but is a matter of what you believe and what you believe why, and this is a matter of who, who you are. So this matter is not easily and quickly fixed. YouTube channels aimed at the elderly appeal uh, to their beliefs by showing conservative commentators who used to have appeared on the news channels. They tell the stories that the audience would like to hear and confirm the bias. The audiences um, selectively accept 
information that they prefer, and this is reinforced by the algorithm of YouTube. On the other hand, YouTube channels targeting young people of attempting to win the audience's attention, uh, like being in a competition. They pursue the fun of camera rather than the facts. The Hungarian Daily newspaper, as you can see in the slides, recently analyzed these patterns and concluded that people in their 20s who are familiar with YouTube are under the influence of extreme right-wing forces who have taken over the YouTube political channels. In terms of thinking about this issue, I was very much inspired by yesterday's presentations of uh, Jerry Jack and, and uh, Sophie Fulat on the recommendation algorithms in digital media and Shin Miskoshi's a critical workshop study for the alternative imagination of digital media platform. The ideas of the algorithm as social construction and the argument of the paradigm shift for infrastructure of information in terms of critical media literacy seem also to be very important uh, and relevant to understand the current situation of the South, South Korean digital media culture. So far, I have described the current situation of digital media use and the is issues of media literacy in South Korea. Now I would like to introduce the key players of media literacy education policies and some developments that they have achieved. I have worked with them on projects, consultancy, and so on. So the Korea Press Foundation is a semi-governmental organization established in accordance with the Act on Promotion of Newspapers. Uh, there is a delegation here. The foundation aims at improving the quality of journalism and supports innovation in the news media to promote better information and welfare for the public, general public. So the Korea Press Foundation supports tailored media literacy and news literacy classes for elementary, middle and high schools by dispatching specialized media education lecturers and providing educational materials. The foundation also dis dispatched media education lecturers to local children's centers, welfare centers, and libraries that wish to conduct media education programs. It has dedicated to support teachers for media education. It has provided teacher training sessions and courses online and offline in association with the local education authorities. It also has sponsored teachers' own news literacy research groups or learning communities. It also holds uh, an annual forum for teachers and lecturers to share the good practices in schools and local communities. It also sponsors university classes such as special lectures by currently working journalists or regular classes using news as the main resources. I took the opportunity to get the sponsorship for my own media education classes for training teachers. It was great to be able to enable my students to read news more regularly and systematically, as well as inviting work journalists to talk about how they might set the agenda and frame the events, as well as making efforts to produce reliable news by fact-checking and by trying out new kinds of storytelling to interact with the audiences. The foundation has also developed specialized teaching materials tailored to school levels. They, uh, these materials are available on the internet for, for me, for media education, and, and introduced by the media leaders, magazines, and blogs online. Another key player in media literacy policy is National Information Society Agency. It has a vision of realizing a healthy, smart society based on the balance and control of using smartphones and digital technology. So uh, they promote internet ethics and cyber awareness. As a part of their nation, nationwide campaign, they create a character called Welly. Melly is a whale who lives in the ocean of the internet. Uh, Welly is a compound word of well-being and whale. It stands for a good digital citizen who replies well on the internet, remembers well the rules of using smartphones and internet, and reacts well 
really well on the internet. So they have four strategies. The first one is prevention of over-dependence and improving self-control. They have increased preventive education programs for all age groups, from young children to the others, including the elderly. Secondly, they develop and provide checklists and health services of counseling and healing. Thirdly, they foster the ability to use smartphones and the internet correctly through the campaigns for smart rest uh, practices. Lastly, they create cooperation system among the government agencies and hospitals. So, this is an example of checklist for infants that parents can use for their children at home. So, I will just read one. The fun in infant follows their parents' guidance on smartphone use, things like that. There is another uh, checklist for adolescents and others. You can have a look. So I fail every time I try to reduce the time I spend using my smartphone, things like that. And so you can score your answers to each idea from scales of one to four and then sum up for the results. This checklist is developed to help people to have better self-control and get counseling or healing services according to your um, results. Okay, and next key player is the Community Media Foundation. There are three delegations here. It was established to increase the public accessibility to media and the use of media for communication. The funds come from Broadcasting Communication Development Funds by the law. The foundation runs seven community centers nationwide to perform projects entrusted from the state or a local government. This is a website of Incheon Community Media Center that I work very closely with uh, as it is located in the city of Incheon where my university is based. Um, the community media centers focus on four areas. The first one is to promote and support school media education. They support schools by dispatching media education specialists, especially in the exam-free uh, semester programs of media schools. The community media center also supports ordinary citizens by providing facilities, equipment, and regular and special lectures that help people to easily understand the broadcasting production process and moving image production skills at no cost. They also run projects for the disabled, multicultural, underprivileged, marginalized communities and various organizations. They have the media sharing bus, which is a mobile broadcasting facility with a radio studio, television, and camera. The bus visits people in rural, mountainous areas and islands who have less accessibility to the community media center. Incheon Community Media Center particularly also make efforts to train independent and personal media creators. It also runs a variety of new media experiential facilities for VR and drones. So, uh, uh, now with media education supported by all these governmental organizations, you might wonder what would be the role of media uh, ministry of education. In fact, media ministry of education's biggest contribution to media literacy, I would say, might be the introduction of core competencies with a vision of raising children to become creative and convergent people. There are six competencies of self-management, knowledge, information processing, creative thinking competence, uh, aesthetic, emotional competency, communication competency, civic competency. Although media literacy is not specified in the curriculum as a term, communication and knowledge information processing competencies can be interpreted as implying the importance of media literacy in terms of broadening the concept of communication and literacy to include multimodal and digital ICT literacies. So in relation to that, the Ministry of Education has commissioned to conduct research on how to integrate media literacy in school curriculum 
and how to develop media literacy textbook units. I was responsible for this research and proposed models to integrate media literacy within the existing curriculum by connecting the core competencies and the elements of media learning that are found in different subjects of Korean, the mother tongue, arts, ethics, social studies, and technology. And um, Ami, uh, my uh, colleague, and I have been monitoring the contents of the uh, textbooks of Korean ethics and social studies from the perspectives of media literacy by the commission of the Ministry of Education. You might be familiar with the sad stories of the problems of Korean schools. Uh, Over-schooling and long hours of study and uh, private education, competitive education, and teachers and textbooks are required to keep neutral, free from commercialism and social and political biases. And learning is not for real life but for tests. Uh, to solve these problems, the new curriculum emphasizes creative experiential learning. And um, first of all, uh, the new curriculum uh, introduced exam-free semester or free semester, as you can see in the slides. So during the spe uh, special semester of the first year of middle school, students study uh, the traditional subjects only in the mornings in the afternoons, they have special activities focusing on career exploration, theme-based activities. This system gives opportunities for media education. Uh, and because of the introduction of the exam-free semester, public media organizations such as the Korea Press Foundation and the Community Media Center uh, have MOU to support schools for their exam-free activities by providing media education programs. So, so far I have shown the key players of media literacy education policies in South Korea and what they have done and achieved. Now I would like to briefly talk about the difficulties and problems that we face now. We have fragmented subject-based school curriculum and learning opportunities. These are elements of, uh, there are elements of subject standards in the national curriculum such as Students should be able to read media and produce with media in Korean curriculum. And students should be able to read images in arts curriculum. But these are all fragmented in each subject. And there is no single word or of media literacy written down in the school curriculum. So media is mainly used as means for learning something else. Creative experiential learning is stressed, but it can be anything. And the South Korean classrooms are still dependent on official school textbooks too much. So even if there are rich and good qualities resources developed by the Korea Press Foundation, for instance, they might not be used much. And teachers always tell that they have little time to use these materials. There is a neutrality regulation, as I said, for the content of textbooks and for teachers in the classroom. We are not allowed to use even commercial advertising and social con socially controversial or political news in the school textbooks. Teachers could use uh, them in the classrooms, but not in the official textbooks. Lastly, uh, lately I have been developing teaching materials for fifth and sixth grade Korean class and I was told not to use, uh, not to expose Google or neighbor, especially, um, and I was advised to use an expression instead, an example of online search engines. <laughs> so <laughs> this means that we can't teach how a specific search engine or platform infrastructure of information might work in reality. Generally, Korean school classrooms are without Wi-Fi and students are not allowed to use their own digital devices in classrooms without permission. Parents and the society are perhaps too much worried about the negative effects of the uses of the digital media and try to protect children obsessively. 
So there is a big gap between classroom learning and real life experiences and practices with, it, with the digital medium. Uh, these difficulties and problems raise an important question of whether students are learning media literacy to solve real life problems. Last semester, I asked my undergraduate students, trainee teachers, to who took the course of media education to feedback on how I could improve my classes. One student said that it was nice to learn about the hate speech on the internet, but it would be even better if we could learn how to respond to them and how to fight against them. Another student said that it would be even better if we could do a real internet broadcasting, producing contents on YouTube and distributing it. Lastly, there was a response that they want to study more deeply about the theories and practical examples of the fun functions and roles of media. Then which way should we go ahead? The digital inquiry-based media literacy model that William Hobbs and Julie Coyo developed gives an inspiration to me. We need to transform literacy and we need integrated curriculum. We need to be able to explore real-life issues that are social and cultural and should be able to learn for changes. My students learn how to get access to and analyze online information and news critically, but they wanted to get involved for social changes in order to tackle the problems of hate speech that cause problems and threats them in their everyday life. Partly because teachers also become targets of hate speech. Media literacy should be a lifelong learning that we want to learn and practice on as digital citizens for the teachers and others, not just uh, children. So now, uh, before I wrap up my talk, I want to raise some questions that we might need to ask ourselves. Okay, the picture is Professor Debbie Buckingham, my PhD supervisor and lifetime mentor who visited South Korea last year and was interviewed by me for the media literacy magazine that the Korea Press Foundation publishes. The magazine highlighted its message that media education should be based on our trust in the children's capabilities rather than the assumption that they know very little about the media or that uh, they are not critical. However, South Korean media literacy policies, for instance, preventive approaches to over-dependence and fake news seem to be based on the perspectives of othering children and young people, as John Potter said yesterday. And at the top of uh, top-down models of teaching and learning, particularly in terms of trying to provide easy and quick solutions to the problems posed by the media. Yesterday, the keynote from the DARE group emphasized the importance of teachers giving agency to their students and taking risks to explore to the, uh, the answers to the difficult questions with their students. Recently, recently, I have been developing a new teacher education program to provide teachers with an opportunity to explore and understand the children's digital media culture, and to think about how to engage with them. Ami is taking part in the program, and we are hoping that this kind of program, more exploratory program, could be a way of overcoming protectionism and top-down approach. Another question on my mind is, how should we approach media literacy education as real-life problem solving for different age and social groups for digital citizenships? And how to build and sustain national and local partnerships among schools, universities, and research institutes, governments and public organizations, educational authorities, non-profit organizations, media industries, teachers and media specialists, parents and local communities. And how could we build and sustain global networks more locally in the region 
as well as worldwide. We always look for other countries' policies, good practices, and research evidence to move forward. So we need to continue global dialogues for a collective and collaborative wisdom for better practices and comparative research. But the global network also needs to be built and sustained more locally within the region. And there is a need for translation for the people who have difficulties in understanding foreign languages such as English. The picture on the right hand side was taken in University of Tokyo 13 years ago. I was there to speak by the invitation of Professor Shin uh, Mitsubishi, uh, who is present here. <laughs> and in fact, I met Professor Alice Lee in Tokyo at that time, and I'm thankful that our network still continues. Professor Mitsubishi Shin publishes media literacy magazines online and offline in Japanese and English, hoping that academics and non-academics could share their media literacy practices beyond the language barriers of foreign languages and academic languages. The left-hand side of the picture is from Korea Press Foundation online media literacy magazine. Uh, in this picture, Ami Kim was interviewing the Finnish media educator, Siruku Kutilainen, who visited last year. Such a magazine, not just academic journal, is very useful for teachers as as well as academic and researchers. I wonder whether we could find ways to connect these kinds of publications platforms for media literacy education. Yesterday we heard that the UNESCO produced so many useful materials, but I wonder how many people would know that such materials would exist and how well they might be used because there is a language barrier. And so I think that there would be an issue of translation and the role of media education experts working more locally in the region in commenting and using those in the actual classrooms or at home. So I would like to wrap up my speech by remembering the past Barry Duncan, the Canadian media literacy pioneer who made a visit to South Korea 15 years ago. He came to a media education conference as a keynote speaker. I was 33 years old at the time. He gave me a small present of Inukshuk, a human-made stone landmark. He told me that Inukshuk was used by the Inuit and other people of the Arctic region of North America for navigation as a point of reference or as a marker for travel routes. He told me that I would need to try to find my own Inukshu in a metaphorical way, not to get lost in proceeding ways forward to media literacy education in South Korea. He told me that I would never be lonely nor get lost if I could follow the footsteps of the people who had already made their ways. I still treasure the little gift he gave me and preparing for my talk for this conference I have realized that I had already found many domestic initiatives as well as the international initiatives. And I have found more through and um, participating in this conference and I'm grateful for that. And um, I hope that you could find your own ones, hopefully some from the stories of the South Korean media literacy education as well. Thank you very much for your attention.
Okay, yeah. Uh, they don't talk about specifically Google, but there is a regulation written down in the document, uh, a guideline for writing textbooks uh, uh, issued by the Ministry of Education. And there is a regulation of keep, keeping neutrality. So uh, you shouldn't offend anybody. Uh, you shouldn't sell anything. Uh, you shouldn't promote any your, uh, of your religious beliefs or your political beliefs and things like that. And also there is a, a law for um, the teachers who are mostly civil servants. So civil servants should keep neutral in terms of their political views. So these are, I think, very strong obstacles uh, for digital citizenship and also for media literacy education. And we really try to challenge that it's uh, really, really rooted in, in, in teachers' minds and, and people's minds and it's not really easy. But we can use Google uh, in the classroom if the teachers want to do it uh, even if it's not in the textbook, but uh, it's really difficult to have a modeling for um, teaching if we are not allowed uh, to use that in, in the textbook. I mean, just to come back on that, that, it really limits the discussion that you can have in a classroom about you know, a, a particular uh, social media and platforms and, and, and and that how they responded to privacy and so on. Has there been a reaction against these guidelines, you know, uh, from from educators in South Korea? Go on strike. Because it really limits your your job. I mean, it's, it seems yeah. quite fundamental. Because uh, there are so much, uh, so many people who really believe that education in schools should be like that. It doesn't have to, uh, it shouldn't be about uh, political propaganda. So um, there are not many teachers who really challenge that, I'm afraid. Thank you. Um, the community media network that you mentioned, do they, you describe them doing work in schools. Do they set up programs outside of schools, kind of a non-formal learning networks that could escape some of the limitations that uh, teachers, for instance, face as you just described? Yeah, yeah, so uh, the community media centers um, are funded uh, by the state uh, and these are public organizations, governmental organizations, but they send teachers to the programs to, uh, for the schools and um, operate uh, those programs. So the specialist media teachers uh, from that organization can, can go to the schools in particular period and also they do have programs in the community outside the schools. So they have both. And it gives really good um, spaces uh, for teachers and, and students uh, to explore uh, what goes on in the media. So, sorry, just to follow up, just to be clear. Can, can students go without the teachers? Yeah, they can go without the teachers because it's for it's open to everybody. So in that are those um, centers more viable, more interesting, more dynamic places of learning? Uh, I think I should say there is a lot of potential. Uh, but how uh, the ways in which the education programs are provided is very top down in some way. So there are uh, particular periods and, and, and time slots. And uh, so 
uh, passed away. <laughs> so I think uh, the presence of the North Korea and 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 that and so it's really difficult. Whenever we try to uh, challenge uh, the authorities, um, the government, it, it, it is it gets frowned upon in a way, and so certainly in in, in classroom. It's a big challenge, yeah. but we need to work on that. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Because of the time limit, maybe I just pick one more last question. Thank you very much for the opportunity to ask the last question. Uh, is uh, media literacy, media information literacy, media education embedded into the uh, Korean pre-service uh, teacher training? No, <laughs> no. Uh, but uh, people like me, I would try uh, to find some uh, spaces uh, by offering some courses, selective courses. So my media education class is a selective course. We have more than 600 students a year, but only like 30 students take this course. But I uh, also have a liberal arts course uh, on uh, digital media culture. And then um, more than 100 students would take it, so I would take the opportunity. And maybe we should build uh, more opportunities uh, in the like um, um, social uh, service learning, things like that. So we should take every opportunity, but not, unfortunately, uh, it's there already. Thank you, Hoshua. I think it's time up. And then we have to move to another session. Thank you very much.